everybody. This is your GM, Jason. We are the 25 North Podcast, but we are not going to be doing an actual play today. Today, we are doing an interview, and we have Stephen Glicker on to talk about book one of Jewel of the Indigo Isles, The Search for the Missing Map. And with me today, I have Rachel. What's going on? Hi. Happy to be here. So... Well, let's, let's let's bring on our guest. Steven, how are you doing? I am doing very well. I'm actually glad to see you somewhat lived past the first adventure. And <laughs> I hope you have a lot of backup crew for the next two. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was one of the things that kind of took my party aback a little bit was... When we had, well, two deaths at this point, just because it started off so, and to put it in the terms that one of my players said, it started off so like colorful and bright and easy. (laughs) And then we get hit with two character deaths, uh, both by the same player. And it's just in back-to-back dungeons. (laughs) And yeah, it's no joke. Well, again, that was... That was on purpose, and someone, as someone who's played, you know, I don't know, a lot of adventure paths. I've played maybe a dozen at this point. What they often will do is they will have the first couple of levels. If you notice, what Paizo does is that they always have it. Sometimes there's like a fair in town, and then you're doing like a lot of non-combat adventure stuff. That way, you get a couple of levels without fighting, and because they don't want to kill you that quickly, you know, so they'll often do that. And I was thinking of that, but I was like, you know, it's very common. And I was like, well, instead, we'll just have a regular, you know, mix of both combat and non-combat, but the combat will be easy. And it's also, you don't want to stress them out. It's like, you're you're starting off, it's a brand new campaign, you don't want to have them die within the first couple of episodes because then people will like bounce off of it. So you really want to ease them into it. And that's probably the best way to do it, at least in my opinion. And so we did start off pretty easy and people have commented on that. It's actually the most commonly commented things. They're like, Oh my God, it was so easy. It's a cakewalk. And I'm like, yeah, like, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. It's going to get harder. Trust me on this. I mean, people actually worried. Like, people were literally like, what happened? It was so easy the first couple of fights. And, you know, it doesn't get that easy. I mean, you have to go underwater, and that one was a little tricky. I mean, you could die if you're not careful, but that also was easy. But then, you know, you get to level two, and it, it ramps up. It ramps up at the, um, when you're playing the harmonica. Uh, that's that, 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 uh, that's a tiered fight. Uh, wave fight and that is where it's sort of like you're like oh boy this is like starting to be like an adventure and that's sort of the the turning point where you have to start paying attention but then then you're level three and then when you're level three it's like and then we don't fool around it's like okay you got level two spells (laughs) you have some more hit points you uh you know you're going into a dungeon like you know all the warning signs are there like start paying attention like if you don't know that you could you could be in trouble, now is the time to pay attention. So it's and then again, but that was all done on purpose. It yeah. wasn't an accident. So you 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 even have the NPC who is literally on the path right outside the dungeon, saying, "Yeah, you don't want to go that way because it's dangerous over there." <laughs> like yeah, the trailblazer's right there saying. Yeah, it's it. You got to watch your step if you if you head that direction. You might want to watch out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we we kind of we're you know we're flag flagging in a bit, and it's a, it's on purpose because it's it's designed for both you know newer GMs and experienced GMs. Experienced GMs could you know they are very comfortable removing things from these adventures and changing it as they want. So that's not. I'm not worried about them. I'm more worried about the newer GMs who want the story to sort of handhold them a little or sort of guide them. Mm -hmm. And everyone, whether they realize it or not, the best adventures usually do that. They're usually much more, I wouldn't call it, I don't call it a railroad. I call it a roller coaster, a little bit more roller coaster than usual. (laughs) 
I know people don't always enjoy that, but I also say, look, if you're playing an adventure path, the name is Adventure Path. It's literally in the name, okay? You're going to be on kind of a very linear adventure. And this one was designed and written in such a way that you do have to kind of go from A to B to C. But I try not to railroad you directly because it's like, okay, you have a map. Yeah, I've got to find the other half of the map. All right, you're probably going to look for the other half of the map. Okay, you can do it in any order you want, but you're probably going to end up at the same place that everyone else does, whether you spend a month in rum plank hanging out or whether you don't. And then once you do find the map, then you got to put the pieces together, and then you're like, okay, you can do it in any order you want. And we even give you methods that you can go forward and back however you want. It's not the most efficient way to do it, but it can be done that way. And... You know, but again, you have to. In fact, the first draft was that um, they have the map and then just brought you to the cave. That was the first draft. And then Patrick Randy wrote it, and I was in my notes, I was like, uh, well, why would they even use the map? There's no point. So then we actually added that whole thing with the dragon scale and that you would use it to unlock the door. And mm-hmm. so if it wasn't for that, because otherwise it's like, all right, we found the map. Cool. Let's go to the cave. And they go to the cave and that's it. And I was like, the map is pointless. So we actually had to sort of, it's a little gamey, but it forced them to actually go visit each point on the map and then to charge up the scale. But also it makes sense because it's like, okay, if this is supposed to be a map and it's supposed to be a challenge and Poppy is trying to challenge the people who find it, she would not make this easy. She wouldn't make it that, oh, you just found the map? Congratulations. It's like, no, here's the map, and you got to go into dangerous places, and you have to find where these uh, touch points are and touch the scale, charge it up, and then you can get to my inner sanctum, and that's the only way to do it. So, again, from a story point of view, we made sure. Like, we always try to make sure it made sense because I've seen it so many times where – Oh, there was, I won't mention the adventure path. There was an adventure path where you're fighting a big bad and the big bad is like level 12 and you're level one. And the, and like, they are like, why doesn't this level 12 bad guy just come in and wipe everyone out? Like, why are they waiting in the wings? They're like, Oh, I, I can't wait to decimate and destroy you all. It's like you're level 12. You could just destroy everyone. Now you don't need to wait till the PCs are level <laughs> 12 and fight you. You know, it doesn't make sense from a, from a story point of view. So every single thing I tried to do the, smell test of does this make sense will the pcs be able to rip this apart and you know we did our best it's impossible to do 100 percent. but if i did at least 98 percent of the pcs can't quite rip it apart and say that does not make sense then i'm pretty happy so you tell me you ran it (laughs) yeah 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 i think it makes it makes it made a lot of sense at least for me i think I, at least I felt like it made sense, but I, again, my perspective, I've read the book. So I had, I have a biased point of view from Rachel though, from a player, did it, did it, did it make sense? Like all the pieces going, coming together for, especially after the review, the reveal of why Poppy was doing everything that she did and why she planned everything Did it all make sense eventually. And did it all come together it did and i liked that it didn't come together too early you know like it's no fun if in the first section you already understand everything you need the build up um so that was nice that you know the whole cult sub story i guess it's not really the sub story it's the main story but you don't know that comes later so the various levels of testing yeah it's all good yeah, that's. So I have uh, I did a I did a video on my channel, and I did like using movie tricks, and I I I, I go by these all the time. And the number one thing is, uh, the uh, the o- A B E always be escalating, like always be escalating. I make sure like always is continuous to escalate. The stakes keep having to get higher and higher. It has to get more and more intense, and. 
for this one, it starts off, well, you're looking for a map. Okay, well, then you're looking for the proving grounds. Okay, now you find a gem. Okay, now you got to find three gems, you know, and now you got to complete the jewel. And, and it, now you're going to have to start sailing around the islands and figure out what's going on there. And and so it's always getting bigger and bigger. And then even in the beginning, you're like, oh, I'm just going on this adventure. But now it's like, wait, there was some cult. Okay, what's this cult all about? And what do they have to do with this? Because no one knows anything about this because you'll find out, like, you know, Poppy is a pretty complex character. She actually a lot of what she did was actually fake uh, what the the public persona of her is not what the private persona of her is at all so that's also kind of fun because you as a pc get to learn something that like no one else gets to know about like you are almost like you know going on your own journey to learn about this mythical creature or mythical creature, myth, mythical person who, you know, it's like, you know, it's like the George Washington of this area. Um, and yet, like, no one knows anything about this history of her. And now you're finding out and then you'll have to uh, see what it all means. Yeah. So. <laughs> it was very cool, though, that there was hints along the way, um, you know, between the statues and the information we got at the library. I think this is the first time that I've gotten to actually whip out my notebook, look back, you know, to page one or two and be like, hey, I actually wrote this down and it actually matters as we got to the statues mm -hmm. at the end, which is very satisfying as a player to be like, I'm not just writing this down for no reason. It matters. Um, All right. The four statues at the, uh, at the yeah. yeah, you have to do. The, the in retrospect, it's like you'll never be 100% happy with it in one adventure. The trap, the hall, the trapping hall, like the three traps, it's like jamming the spike pit is a little tricky. That That's like, we probably should have made that one a little bit easier <laughs> to, to, to jam. And you know what? If I was a GM and running it, I'd, I'd give them like other ways to jam it too. They don't have to use like crazy hardness. The fire and ice trap that's just thievery like you either would just break it and just jam it and take damage uh and then the lightning glow is pretty that's the easiest one it's like just kill it just kill the lightning glow that's all you need to do and it's done so it's not it's not that hard but in the scheme of things i could see it getting crazy <laughs> you even drop a scroll of shatter yeah for that i know we're like here you go and there's a crowbar that you can use uh, earlier. There's like a bar too that you can get, which yeah. will work. So we gave you what you needed. You just, uh, yeah, which is totally the old school way of doing it. I mean, <laughs> old campaigns. If you find something, you find the potion of platinum dragon control. You're gonna run into a dragon. Like you gotta pay attention to that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Earlier, earlier, Stephen, you had mentioned being a bit gamey, and I know that you have a. You have a history in video games. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to, for our listeners who don't quite know, could you just give us a brief background about some, uh, about your, your history and huh. how, what you, what you, what you've done in video gaming and then how, how you got into tabletop gaming and role for combat specifically. So very quick. I've been playing D and D since the seventies and grew up with the whole D and D as a kid and the whole satan. Everything you see, basically stranger things is my life, except for the demon, you know, but every, <laughs> every other aspect of that is actually kind of frightening. When I watched that show, uh, biked around as a kid, went to the mall every weekend, uh, the wallpaper in, um, Oh, I uh, forgot uh, one of the kids' rooms. I even had the same wallpaper. I was like, it, it was like, oh my god, this is exactly what my room looked like. I was like freaking out. It's it's kind of insane. Dressed so, up as Ghostbusters for Halloween. Oh, uh, well, I was. Let's see, I was fourteen for that, so I don't think I dressed up as Ghostbusters. But <laughs> they're about the same age I was. They're pretty close, so it's very interesting. Uh, but the whole thing of like sitting and playing D anD D and playing board games and hanging out all day. I mean, I did that growing up and, uh, and of course was heavily into video games and in the two thousands and the nineties, uh, I had a lot of friends 
who worked at like Blizzard and Activision and a lot of video game companies. And I was really, really into the video game scene and the board game scene and the tabletop scene, first of all, is very, very small. I mean, it's still really small, but back then it was really small and only a couple of people at most. And, you know, I met Steve Jackson at, at some cons and I would, you know, meet like the, the TSR people quite a bit, but I actually started a podcast called gaming Steve, which was like one of the first podcasts like ever. It was like, it came out back in like, but it's way uh, world of Warcraft just came out. That's when I started the podcast. So it's pretty old and it was a video game podcast. And then through that, I met everyone. Like I just was meeting everyone and everything. And, and then um, I, it's just my best friend was the lead on world of Warcraft. I was working with blizzard independently and helping them out. And John stats, who's a regular on my show. And one of my best friends, he, was the first 3D designer ever ha- hired by Blizzard for WoW. And he designed, like, I'll put it this way, if you played WoW and you played any dungeon from the first, you know, 10, 15 years, he made those dungeons. He made everything. He made every dungeon, every raid, everything. Wow. So that's what he did, yeah. And he designed them. He, he literally, there's not a lot of people in this world who can say they literally designed dungeons for a living and that, Hundreds of millions of people have played his dungeons, but he can say that, which is insane. So he and I actually compared notes even on dungeon design and, you know, monster design. And so having a resource like that is very fascinating from the TTRPG standpoint because, you know, they know what works and what doesn't work from the history of World of Warcraft, which is what I used a lot. Uh, I, I still refer to a lot of things I learned from back then. And still talk to John all the time, so I can ask him, and he just knows. And then I kind of stopped that. I don't know why. I just kind of stopped doing it. It got crowded, and there was a million people. I probably wish I kept doing it because it was really popular. And then I ended up switching. And we were playing a weekly game of Pathfinder pretty much every week. We did Age of Worms, which was the first adventure path I ever nice. did for five of three point five. It's my favorite of all time, and that one is oh. That is such a good adventure path. Very hard, but it's it's just the story is so legendary and it's so good, that adventure path. And after that, we were playing, you know, adventure paths on our own. We played a lot and I always told my group and we only play online because we all moved away. I've been online for like 12 years now. And I said, hey, we should really record an adventure path. And they said no. And then I eventually convinced them. Actually, then Glass Cannon came out. And then I was like, that's it. We're next. We're starting an adventure path. And I'm starting to record it because I've been asking you guys for years. And you said no. And if you don't want to play, then don't play. And they're all like, fine. So then they, you know, they all fought me. But of course, they all loved it. So whatever. And it was actually Starfinder. And then uh, that's where Roll from Combat started in 2017. And then, very long story short, without going it's already a long story so i'll try to make it shorter is that i met eric mona at pax a few years ago and they had the rpg superstar and then the rpg superstar was like dead and i asked him if uh, i could take it over and he said sure he's like sure why not and so and he and i were pretty friendly at that point i was working a lot with paizo and i'm a partner with them and so I took over RPG Superstar, and then two years ago, it was just going to be the Battles of Best area, and I was just going to release it. And all the monsters from Battles of Best area, and all the monsters you're fighting, are all from just you know entries from RPG Superstar. Like most of them, not all of them, like ninety nine percent of them, ninety five percent. And so everything in this adventure is from Battles of Best area. So nothing in there except the only thing I think is the skeleton, like. That one they cheated because it's like, well, you can only, I can't have, a, okay, a skeleton's a skeleton. I can't really, but at least they're Gamayan skeletons. So I'm like, all right, so they're different types <laughs> of skeletons. You know, I made them a little different. But everything <laughs> else is from here. So you don't know what's in here. And I was supposed to just have the book come out. And uh, COVID happened. And I was like, well, at least I'll just have the book come out and they'll sell it at the Paizo booth. And then Pies was like, oh, we're not going to Gen Con. And I was like, uh-oh, now what? I just finished this book. And then my friends from Blizzard were like, hey, you should just do a Kickstarter. We all do Kickstarters, and they do great. So I did the Kickstarter. And I was talking to Ron Lundeen and Patrick Rennie. Patrick Rennie ran RPG Superstar. And pa- Ron Lundeen and Patrick Rennie wrote the first and second adventure 
they ran the adventure paths for Paizo. They ran all of them. They actually, they dually ran them. Like, they would each do one, because uh, there's two adventure paths a year, and they would each do one a year. So they would run each run one. And then I was talking to them, and they're like, you know, hey, you guys want to do something? And they're like, well, we know how to do adventures, so we can do adventures. I'm like, okay, I love adventures. Not knowing that was the stupidest decision I ever made in my entire <laughs> life. <laughs> like, by far, by stupid. I was like, this, this adventure has by far been the hardest thing I've ever done, ever. And I've done a lot of hard things, and this thing makes them all pale in comparison. Don't do not do it. Uh, and then I also had access to Linda Zay's Palmer, who runs all society. So I was sort of like a catch-22. I'm like, all right, I literally have access to three of the best, most experienced adventure writers in history, like, ever. Like, who has written more adventures than these three combined, other than, like, Gary Gygax and a few others? There's very few people in this world. So I was like, I really can't miss this opportunity to have these, like, pros write this adventure. And that's kind of where it came from. And then since then, you know, we now come out with a fair amount of things. We have the Battles of Bestray, Strange and Unusual, which was the sequel. We have Battles of Ancestry Dragons, where you can play a dragon. We obviously have the Jeweled Indigo Isle, which the hardcover book is literally being shipped to the warehouse right now. So it will be in everyone's hands finally by August. By August, everyone will have it once and for all. But the module's out on Foundry, and the PDF has been out actually for a couple of months now. Uh, and now we're doing a new Kickstarter that you mm-hmm. can go to indigo.rollforcombat.com, which is the world of Battle Zoo Indigo Isles, where it is literally the Indigo Isles in depth and detail, where you can, and it's big, it's like 240 pages, and a lot of people have asked for it. So we go into all the cities, and we give city hooks and settlements and NPCs and adventure hooks. So it's it's both for pcs because there's 10 ancestries in there and there's lots of player options and it's for gms because there's a lot of good ideas you know and because it's a an island you can just put it in anywhere you want you can put in galarian you can put in your 5e game you can you know whatever you want it's designed to be placed into your world very simply it's basically hawaii i mean that's kind of what it's based off of so mm-hmm. and that is should be live by the time everyone's listening to it and that is actually going to come out as soon as the Kickstarter ends. So unlike this book, which it took two years, uh, we've been secretly writing this book over the last couple of months, and it's done. So we will mm. allow you to have the book as soon as it comes out. But there is one secret thing we added to the book, is if you back the Kickstarter, you get to submit your own island idea. And... We are going to take anywhere from three to infinite number of islands, not infinite, but like 10, 20 islands. And Mark Seifter will write your island for you. So you just submit an idea. You just like you can be like the Island of Snakes. It's filled with lots of snakes. And he was like, oh, that's a good <laughs> idea. Let's make the Island of Snakes. And then he'll write it. And But you'll get full credit. So And that will be added. We're going to get that done very quick. And so by the time the Kickstarter ends... A few weeks later, the PDF will come out with all the all the islands from all the submissions because we like to have people from the community help out. Like a lot of what we've been doing, pretty much all of our books, we have the community help design it or design it. Like mm-hmm. uh, the dragon book, uh, Ginny D designed one of the dragons. Uh, she designed the t- toadstool dragon, and in this book, we actually have Bob World Builder actually wrote uh, Moonshadow. Uh, the hero of the whole thing. And then we have um, other people from the community who are designing it. So this way you can design islands and if they're cool, we'll get it in the book and you don't have to worry about writing it. Uh, we'll have Mark do it. So pr- it's probably more fun <laughs> to have Mark do it because he knows what he's doing. That's awesome. And that's it. And we're, we're planning and having now we're in a schedule. We'll probably have new books like every four months or so we'll have something new. And um, there you go. Yeah, and I can confirm that that you guys like to take community feedback because I attend the Year of Monsters monthly streams, the private streams for the for the backers for Year of Monsters, where right. we go through the 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 that month's Year of Monster or Year yeah, of Monster release. Yeah, 
and we and we look through some of the feats and we talk about you know this is what's working this is what's not working here's what's missing and how could we add a little bit more flavor or you know tweak this and so those those are at least for me who um i like to submit monsters for rpg superstar and i i have a monster in strange and unusual so you do um, which one's yours uh the cathartic worm oh my god that one's one of the better ones not that they're all they're all good that one's one of the weirdest craziest ones that's like the dance worm (laughs) It's like yeah, the that's dance the, the party. emotion sucker. Yeah, yeah, I like that one. That one I got. That was like I did that art. That was like the last art too. It was like <laughs> it's like the last one we did. The cathartic worm. Yeah, that one's. Uh, I'm looking it up now. I didn't know that was you. Uh, yeah, that was me. But cool. it, it's it's super educational because I like because uh, hearing how Mark talks about mechanics is I was like oh wow I, it's it's super enlightening those those streams. <laughs> It's incredibly complex. <laughs> it's the stuff we do is um, it's very math heavy. That's the secret is like people don't realize it. That's why the world of video games and TTRPGs are so close, a lot closer than people think. Because like video games, like it's all math. Like it's literally all math. Like you wouldn't believe it's it's like all this math makes all these graphics happen. But it's 99 percent math. And the secret of why Pathfinder works so well is literally the math engine behind it. Uh, I mean, some people joke, it's, oh, math finder. I'm like, yeah, you're, you know what? If you have strong math and if you have strong system, the game will work as opposed to other games that are supposed to have it. You know, that's the problem with some, it's like some games don't have it like fiasco and, you know, and others that are light and they're not supposed to have it and that's fine. But if you're going to have a very strong, robust game that you expect the math to work and it doesn't, that's actually worse in my opinion. Um, yeah, cathartic worm. Oh yeah, here we go. That's the party crasher worm. I like that worm. There you go. You went on a little table you gave me, that D six table. That was a pain in the neck to lay out. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh I think that was one of the feedback I got from uh, one of the judges panels is the um the randomized table. It was just like, oh, those are that's always it's always tough to have a randomized table it is. in a monster stat block. It's I was very like, rare. yeah. It's so rare because I look for another monster to use it as a template, and there are none. So I had to invent it. So there you go. <laughs> so and, oh um, yeah, I do all the layouts for all the books too. So yeah, um, I really wish I wasn't, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as far as the adventure goes, one of the things that drew me to it right away is pirates. I I love pirates, and. You know, we we had one pirate adventure in Skulls and Shackles, and that was one that, you know, depending on who you talk to, some folks can take it or leave it. Mm-hmm. You know, reviews on that can be mixed depending on on certain circumstances. You know, I've, I was talking to Mark about this through, in Discord, and, you know, he said that Linda ran it for him and his friends, and he loved it. You know, I was talking to some other friends and he says like it, it, they didn't care for it too much. But so when I saw you guys were, were putting out a pirate adventure, I jumped at the opportunity to see if I could get access to it early so we could run as a podcast, especially when I saw that when I heard you talking about it being Pixar Guardians of the Galaxy in flavor and theme. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to know, like, what was the inspiration and the, like, the genesis for that, for this kind of adventure? So what ended up happening was Patrick Rennie came up with the original concept and he said, oh, I have this idea, Jewel of the Indigo Isles, uh, and and that was it. Like, he literally, that's, I think it was, it was something very vague. Because I was like, we we're trying to come up with an idea for an adventure. I'll be honest, we didn't have one. And the part of what Patrick was doing is he was going to come up with the first adventure. And I said, do you have some ideas? And, you know, he, and he came up with this. And as soon as he said that, for whatever reason, it all clicked. And I was like, wait, Jewel of the Indigo Isles? I have an idea. And then it all was like, you know, like a video game. Like, okay, wait, we can have this jewel and you can have four parts and you have to find each part and put it together. And then, and then it just went. And then the other thing is we wanted to figure out how to get 
as many of the monsters from the Battles of Best area into it. And again, you guys aren't far enough and I don't want to get spoilers, but there's a lot of the monsters, <laughs> especially some of the big ones, like all the, but this way, all the platinum and the grand prize winning monsters, they all show up, all of them. Not, not every single one. I couldn't get them all in, but those are guaranteed to appear. So that those five families are in there. So we were able to figure out how to make a story around those types of monsters. We kind of went a little backwards and then that was it. And then I sat down and wrote the outline for the adventure. And most outlines are a couple thousand words. My outline was like 35,000 words, which is the size of an adventure, by the way. So I literally wrote the whole thing, but Mine was the story. I, I gave them the settings, the locations. I came up with the islands. You know, I came up with the three main islands. And then I came up with what would happen at each one. And then I, I gave all the major story beats. And I, I came up with pretty much the outline of the adventure. But one thing that adventure writers complain about is that some of them, they get very specific notes to the point that, like, this literally has to happen in this adventure and in this dungeon. So I actually didn't have that. Strangely, the first adventure I had the least input in, in some ways, I just sort of gave the general scope of how it would go and how the map would work and then how they would find the proving grounds. And I haven't looked at it. Uh, it, I wrote the whole thing. It was like a fever dream. I've never had this happen to me, but I was like, it it all came to me at once. And then I was just writing and writing. And I wrote for like a week straight. Like I was literally getting up and just writing until I fell asleep every day. And it just, I couldn't get the ideas out fast enough. And the whole thing flowed. And I used a lot of my movie knowledge. So the pirates come from Pirates of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing about this is that they're all party pirates party pirates party pirates because they're pirates but poppy was more of jack sparrow type pirate so what they think pirates are is not what we think pirates are so they're like oh we're pirates like are we're pirates that they're, they're not really pirates they don't know what pirates are they're crazy but there are real pirates so it's it goes both ways and that actually was to allow you as the gym which i think uh, Skull and Shackles had problems with is that they very narrowly defined what a pirate is and if you if it didn't fit your narrative idea of what a pirate was in your mind you might not have a good you might not have a good time with that adventure and that adventure is fairly narrow in scope in the fact that you have to play a bad guy and you have like you actually have to do very certain things in that adventure and if you don't it sort of breaks uh, so I made sure to avoid that, that we're like, oh, you want to be a scum and villainy pirate? You can do that. You can be that. It's fine. Those exist. And you re- encounter them in the beginning. You know, those exist. Oh, you want to be a party pirate and just like throw parties and go on a glitter parade? We got those too. You know, you want to be a silly <laughs> pirate? We got those too. You can be anything you want. And because all those definitions are correct and all of those exist in this world. So that's one of the first things we did. And then for... Oh, I can't, I can't spoil it, but the the closest analogy of this, this adventure, I say Pixar, and by Pixar, I use that because Pixar is very good at starting off, and this is on purpose, they start off all their movies very fun and light and fanciful, and then it gets very serious, and then it gets very, there's always a very scary part, and you're like, whoa, and they do that because emotions register strong feelings and permanent memories it's it's a known fact so if you can register strong emotion connection you will remember this adventure forever and more importantly you probably have good memories of it so what you were saying before of how this adventure started to turn very quickly and go in weird directions i did that on purpose or tried to do it on purpose so that you're like, you won't forget. You won't forget the time. Like you just said, like we found the journal and we're like, Oh my God. Wow. Like this was all prelude. Like 
we're 50 episodes in and now the adventure is really starting or like you're like oh my god we are actually able to take notes and i used my real knowledge and i and i in what i worked in one i i uh, was able to get the jewel by doing that you know i was like good you'll remember that forever you probably don't remember the fight with whoever you know like that sort of stuff disappears from your memory and there's a lot <laughs> a lot more of that to come but if you saw guardians of the galaxy 3 not even one not even two guardians of the galaxy 3 is very close to this adventure it's really <laughs> frighteningly close james gunn is probably the spirit if he was good if james gunn was going to direct this it would be he would be he would be the director it wouldn't be steven spielberg it wouldn't be pixar it wouldn't be it would be james gunn because james gunn puts in horror he's very good at mixing horror with light fantasy and silliness and he just throws all those emotions have you seen like i know a lot of people have seen guardians of the galaxy 3 and it wrecked them you know they're just like oh my god my my son i brought him to see it and I'm like, did you like it? And he's just like, kind of. And I'm like, and the next day he's like, oh my God, that movie was so sad. It was so, I was so angry. And there's so many emotions in that movie. I'm like, and that's why it's genius and such a good movie because it actually made you feel something and it, you'll never forget it. And it made you think about it for days after. And that's mm -hmm. what I, hopefully this adventure will do is especially especially by the end you'll be like oh my god what is going <laughs> on and you are going to be like losing your mind <laughs> so you got you got a lot to look forward to yeah rachel it's not ominous at all i'm not terrified <laughs> <laughs> everything's fine yeah we'll i see. um <laughs> so i that was one of the things too that when you were talking about the adventure you know being using a lot of script writing tricks and mm -hmm. movie tricks. Yeah. I myself am a movie nerd and I love movies. So mm -hmm. that's another thing that really drew me to the point where it's just like when I had my players build their characters, one of the things that uh, one of my favorite directors likes to do with his actors, uh, that's Guillermo del Toro. Yeah. What he likes to do with his actors is he likes to write like journals or diary entries or give them like trinkets mm -hmm. and say that this is, this is belongs to your character and there's a whole story and backstory and intricate plot element to that trinket or that diary or whatever, but it's never really brought up in the movie. It just always adds a little dimension to the character and so what I did for the characters in this adventure is I allowed them to pick a rare trait thing, whether that's a background or a feat or a weapon or what have you, but I wanted them to keep it secret to allow the, to give them an element of backstory or purpose or add to their personality and to their character. So um, that was one of the things that really allow that really drew me to it. So I'm curious as to what some, what were some of the tricks and some of the script writing. Uh, tricks. Yeah. <laughs> tricks. Yeah. yeah. Script writing tricks. So there's a couple. I actually did a video. It's actually one of my most popular videos is that I use. It was like five script writing techniques to make your games better. And the bag, first one is always be escalating. Um, you know, you always have to have the stakes bigger and higher. And, you know, it's hard to do that, especially these movies. But if you think about like Age of Ultron or the uh, not Age of Ultron, man, they tried. That didn't really work. But um, Infinity War, well, that's about as big as stakes as you can get. Like, okay, you have to get the Infinity Stones and then uh you snap and the half the universe dies i'm like well like that's that's pretty big stakes you know but like if you think about all the other movies leading up to it you know there was always those were always smaller and they led to if that movie didn't have stakes that high that movie i guarantee would not have been the success it was it just doesn't matter what the cgi was it doesn't matter like you felt like okay 
these people are literally saving, you know, fighting to save the universe. Like that, that is big stakes. So, but, but if you look at the previous movies, those were lower stakes. So you're always upping the stakes, which is actually one of the main reasons why these secondary movies is a whole other podcast uh, aren't doing as well because people are like, well, you can only go down from here and people mm-hmm. ha- are sort of getting disconnected from these new movies and these new shows. And this, I'm like, how can you go down? It's like, you can't go down. And they already went to the, the, it was as high as you can go. You're trying to reset it. It's very hard to do that. One of the advantages of this, and actually that's why I think the six book adventure pass are very hard to run because it's hard to keep that tension up for six books and to have the stakes continuously improve. So threes was perfect because it's a trilogy. It's like a, so there you go. It's like a, it's like a trilogy. It's like any movie trilogy, you know, and the first, it was designed that way. In fact, the, the names of the titles of each adventure is designed sort of like Indiana Jones. Like I actually used an Indiana Jones font in the Kickstarter, you know, it's like, Search for the missing map. And then, wait, what's the second one? I forgot. It's been so long since they opened it. Uh, Voyage to Runaway Reef. Oh, yeah, that's it. Voyage to Runaway Reef. Yeah, you know, you can hear it when you say it. It sounds like, oh, it's like, search for the missing map. Voyage to Runaway Reef. I will not tell you the last one because it spoils it. So there, we got two of the three (laughs) adventure titles. But they all have that type of adventure. And the first one starts off with, the small stakes and then the next one is like oh okay we have this jewel and like it was handed down and protected and and there was some great evil that was being used and like oh my god what's going on we got to figure this out and like stakes are start starting to increase and things are getting more serious and what started out as a fun adventure has now turned into something much more and the third one um uh, Infinity War. That's that's what that's, 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 that's I'll leave it at that. It gets nuts. So that's a trick. Uh, the emotions that I felt very, very, very strongly about, and I can't get into it without heavy spoilers. But I made sure that there was lots of emotions. And a lot of different types of adventures that you're going to go on in different locales. And there's a lot of ticking clocks. So that's that's the old secret. They always have to have a ticking clock. So that if you don't have a, like you don't really have a ticking clock in the first adventure. And that's actually on purpose because this way you can go it at your own pace. You know, in theory, it's like if you guys all died and you can just, or if three of the four people die in the caves, you can just go back and go back to town and get three new ones and come back. Like, there's no time limit. You're not running to do that. It's going to start getting more ticky. Like, it's going to, like, now you're going to start having time limits. Like, things are going to go much faster and you're going to actually have external pressures put on you. And that will increase the stakes and make things more stressful, which will increase the tension. But in terms of even just who and what you're fighting will go from, oh, we're fighting really fun guys. And it's going to get really, really. Have you seen Slither? Have you seen Slither Mm -hmm. by James Gunn? Yes. Okay. Well, actually, no, I have a better idea. Okay. Have you seen The Frighteners? I use The Frighteners as an example. The Frighteners is probably yeah. one of the best examples of this, and that's by um, P- you know, uh, Peter Jackson. Yeah, you know, Lord of the Rings. He starts off that movie. Starts off. It's one of my favorite movies because it starts off as a comedy. It's literally a comedy. You're like, okay, I'm watching this. It's a very funny comedy, and then it goes into a mystery and love story, and you're like, what just happened? It totally changed. And then the last half is pure horror. And you're like, what is going on? And it is very, I remember coming out of the theater like, what the hell did I just see? I've never seen a movie go from pure comedy to pure love story to pure horror in a span of two hours. And it's very memorable. Well, you're going to have that. You're going to go through lots of different types of story very quickly. And other people do that, but they usually do that per book. A good example of that is Carrying Crown does that, 
where like one book is the vampire book, one book is the Frankenstein book, one book is the Cthulhu book. So throughout the whole book, you're finding Cthulhu and monsters in like uh, book four. And I think book two was the Frankenstein. Actually, it was cool. You're Frankenstein on trial and you were the defender of Frankenstein, which mm-hmm. was fantastic adventure by Richard Pett. I uh, love that one. This one, I did it per, not per book, but per chapter. So one chapter you'll be doing something, but then the next chapter you'll be doing something else. So it goes very fast. It's going to be shifting tone very quickly. Um, so that's that's another trick. Yeah, even in the um, even in book one, there, there you, you get those those mixed emotions, especially when you find Poppy's journal and you realize that that she might not be who she sh- who she she said she was. Like right. the image that she's portrayed and she's thought of in Rumplank isn't might not exactly be at what everybody believes and we had um the valmo character took the poppy fanatic background and it was like cory kind of played it a little i mean he was playing a dungeon so he was trying to play it off as very stoic but he he did a pretty good job as like wait a second let me see that i i don't believe you <laughs> what, what what are you saying <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's the point yeah it was um there the, yeah you could tell that there were some mixed emotions in the party too like wait a second what mm-hmm. I, you're saying that poppy's not this great pirate so the other thing we did and this is the one that killed me uh don't ever do this again but um so like with the harry potter books i remember when i was reading them and spoilers, if you never read it, um, you know, the rat, the was it Ron's pet rat, turns out to be, you know, a polymorph bad guy the whole time. And you don't find that out to like what book two or three. And I'm like, oh my God. I was like, now that is set up. Like that is that really stuck with me because it's like that changes everything. Well, when Paizo writes adventure paths are all done in silos. So that's why each one is it unconnected from one another i was like okay i'm gonna have this where they're all interconnected with each other so like things that happen in the first adventure are gonna happen in the second and third adventure especially the third and everyone said don't do it it's impossible and they were right (laughs) do not do (laughs) it is impossible uh it's really hard to do especially for a big one because it prevented me from putting out the adventures because I had to keep going back and change things. That's why they do it siloed. So the adventures are standalone. So, but my pain is your gain. So now hopefully you will get to see and do cool things and things that happen in the first adventure will show up now in the second one. Cause you're about to go on a trip. You're about to go on a boat and you can bring people from Rumplank with you, like if you want, and you're bringing a couple, I think. So that that's fun because now you could bring and explore the characters. And then the final book, you'll see other people you encountered. And so it, you get to see them throughout the story and see their arc. And that's very rare. That's like very rare to see with NPCs. And we did that with a lot of NPCs. And we did that with cities and towns and just the, the, the islands themselves. So, and again, that's the secret of these good movies. Um, you know, Star Wars is a good example. You know, it's like the trilogy. You can see how things escalated and how characters changed. And, you know, bad guys are in one book or one movie are in the second and third movie. Like you need to have them continuously appear because then they have a stronger connection uh, between you and the world. So that's something else that's going to really bring it to home, I think, especially the third book, because you'll be seeing a lot of uh, familiar faces. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think the NPCs were were a great addition, which is why I when I, after reading the books, I tried to make such a concerted effort to give each of the NPCs such an individual distinctive voice mm-hmm. that could be remembered. So as soon as I spoke as that NPC, and the horse the king, the king of Rumplank. I, that everybody could immediately like know that okay, this is the king. The king's talking, you know. So I could 
just like that they're because they are such a big part of the story much more so than any other adventure path that i've run i mean beyond Mm. like extinction curse where the circus is there for you the entire adventure kind of i'm running extinction curse but it kind of ends like after like the fourth book it kind of stops and then without spoilers like it totally stops after the fifth and sixth point it's like right it's like bye bye circus it's like circus is gone so and i made sure that that doesn't happen in this and the other thing is is that we had pictures of nearly every like any npc you encounter we have a picture for so that way you actually will see them and they're in the you know you'll actually have a connection to them um so that was important as well like we have way too many pictures way too many amazing pictures though i mean that was definitely a big thing that we all commented on every time jason showed us a picture was how awesome all the artwork was (laughs) yeah wait until you see uh some of the nasty stuff coming up (laughs) (laughs) it'll be fun so yeah i mean that i mean all this stuff sounds like oh yeah of course i can do that i'm like yeah it's harder. To, it's harder than you think. I mean, the big secret is that's why you planned this out. Like, you know, I couldn't just have them just like write an adventure. You know, like, you know, it's again the outline was thirty five thousand words, which is, you know, what's that? It's a lot. It's 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 big. It's something like seventy pages, I think. Yeah, it's seventy pages. So, and that's just the outline of the adventure. So, you know, we were very careful to make sure, and then when the writers did it and that's why it took them a while to write because they would not always include the stuff because then I would have to go back and rewrite it and update it and change it so that it would, um, it would uh, always have, you know, connections between previous and that's what took so long because they weren't always good at doing that because they didn't see and read all the adventures, but I did. So I have to go back and rewrite major parts of the second and third adventure to make sure I included the first adventure that's why i said the first adventure is probably the most basic but then it gets way more complex from the next two like way more complex uh especially the third one gets like out of control but so in theory you can do this but it uh i don't recommend you try <laughs> it's 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 a it's a very hard uh and it was kind of a nightmare and then even i did an interview with some Paizo people and they were laughing at me on the interview. Like, ah, you, you were a sucker. Why'd you do it that way? I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's all right. I'll never do it again. <laughs> it so. is so much more satisfying as a player though, to have the foreshadowing actually established. Like one of my least favorite things in books and movies is where the twist comes out of nowhere, like literally out of nowhere. And you're like, you didn't plan this. So I'm very excited yeah. that you've planted all of it. Yeah, even though it was planned. a nightmare. Yes. Yeah, everything <laughs> everything's planned. Everything's planned. Every like to the point of even like what Rum Plank is like the character, like everything, even the history of the of the king and the queen, and like where they came from, and just you know every aspect of this actually has a background. Like we, it's just uh, the only other the person who did this who is also really good, David Eddings, did that. Um, and I use that too. So David Eddings would write extensive and Sanderson does it too. Sanderson writes extensive books on his, on his worlds before he even writes the book or to uh, Tolkien you know. or Tolkien. Right. Super old. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's where mine mind went. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I, mine's closer to, uh, you see, actually of modern day writers, Eddings is probably the one that's most video gamey because I mean, it's been a long time since I read the Belgariad, but if you remember, I'm sure most people listening read the Belgariad, it, it would go from like, Oh, this is the world of, I'm just, I can't remember. It's been so long. Oh, this is the horse world or the horse country where everyone's riding horses. Then you go somewhere else. It's like, Oh, this is the merchant place where everyone's, these are like the zones of world of Warcraft. If you remember, like every zone was its own world within it. And Galarian's that way too. Like every country is its own zone. And that's very video gaming. You know, video game, you always has like, okay, now you're in the winter zone. Now you're in the fire zone. Now you're in the underwater zone. You know, it goes zone to zone to zone. And that actually works very well from a game point of view. And that was what you guys were doing, whether you realized it or not, is that first zone was chapter one and you're in the city. So that's the city zone. And that's on purpose to get you to know the city and to ease you into it and to learn what you're 
therefore and who you are and what the city's like in the world and then zone two was the wilderness zone where you're learning around around the city so you learn a little bit more about the island and then zone three was a dungeon but a traditional fight kill puzzle dungeon and then zone four was more of the challenge dungeon which was very you know it's a very different type of dungeon that's more the old school like ooh, yeah there's fights in there but that's not really the point it's more to figure out and to learn and to do lore and history and that's that dungeon so and that's another secret is that it's very video gamey and it's very like oh that's so fake i'm like yeah but it works okay mm-hmm. you know it, but people like to have things carp carp Carmentalized, yes. Siloed, so that you know what you're in for, and mentally you can relax. And then you also mentally know, okay, I'm in the dungeon, dungeon. I'm going to be fighting stuff. So you're more on. And I heard it when I listened to your actual play. You guys are definitely more. You guys are always going a little slow, and you're always on point and hit your weapons out. Like everyone's ready to go. And then. For the second part of the dungeon, you were like that too. You definitely were much slower, but like we also even had the reset area where you can rest up uh, mm-hmm. the uh, the temple of uh, Z- of uh, uh, Ezo, where you could like rest up. Um, yep, you know things like that. So, but yeah, I, I even warned the party too, as I was just like, well, you know, like this is more going to be more the. More, more, more of like the the skill challenge dungeon part of it, where mm-hmm. and I think and so I think naturally you figured this out too, where it's just like well, still that character is going to be making a lot more perception checks and a lot more search checks. Yeah, and I had to switch that, flip that switch. Yeah. So, but also that gives everyone the chance to shine because like there mm-hmm. is, I think. I forget it was Skull of Shackles, but there was like one adventure. I don't remember which adventure it was, but they it, they it turned out there was nothing for rogues to do ever. Like they actually went through the adventure and someone's like, uh, you know, there was like no traps and nothing for rogues to do throughout the entire dungeon. And they were like, I remember Pies was like, oh, <laughs> like, yeah, we kind of forgot. It. And then suddenly, you know, you're playing the rogue. You needed for them to shine. So that's something else that's important is you need to have a mixture of activities so that you have uh, general fighting, trapping, skills, social. You know, that's what the second part was, a lot of social interaction. So you need to have a little bit of everything so everyone can do something. And, you know, that's, again, it's harder. It's easier said than done. You know, it's like it was all conscious. It was conscious effort to make sure that's all in there. So. So, did you have any um, favorite parts of the adventure, Rachel? Of the first well, book? My favorite fight was actually the one you kind of mentioned. the In the shipwreck, right towards the beginning with the underwater. I really liked that the party was almost forced to split as we ended up being. That some of us stayed on shore, some of us were in the water, and some of us had gotten all the way to the other side where the first, what are they called? The dolls. Spring jaw dolls. Yeah. Spring jaw dolls. Um, (laughs) And just Uh, got to bring in all the mechanics of underwater fighting, which was interesting. The spring jaw dolls is funny because they have the scroll and they run away. (laughs) That's why I love when I do that. I do that in my adventure. Like, like there it is. And it runs away. No, what are you doing? Come back here. (laughs) That's like the worst feeling. (laughs) And it forces you to make stupid decisions when you start seeing the bad guy running away with your treasure. And it it makes the PCs do dumb things in the water. Not Mm -hmm. a smart idea. For sure. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. If two of us didn't breathe water, we would have, we would have been a different story. Uh, Yeah. It would be dead. (laughs) There was nowhere for it to go though. It's like, it's more like you look at it like, Oh my God. But it's like, it's just not that going anywhere. Right, it's on the but other it's side. still funny. It's just like, mm-hmm. See, that's the other part. That see, that's memorable. That's the point. That was why it was memorable. It's like anyone could just have the treasure there. That's easy. But having the treasure run away from you, that's that's <laughs> comedy. Yes, it's <laughs> a good moment. And that, then the other one is like even when you said like when you get the jewel, 
um, the first jewel and you're like, you, you have to go through and solve the puzzles. And then you're like, yes. And you feel like you earned it. Like it was, it's like anyone could fight. That's easy. But like actually using your real brain and bringing out notes, you're like, yes. And you feel like you yeah. actually earned it. So Right. Not just rolling. Oh yeah. You'll, you'll feel like you earned the next ones. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be like, you're going to be sitting there like, oh, my God, I'm going to kill Steve. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Steve? When you when you were putting together the adventure, what were some of the encounters or some of the moments that you were really that really stuck out to you that you were looking forward to people playing the most in this part, this particular book? Yeah, this one is the most sedate one uh, compared to all of them so i really i mean i like the uh i i like the duel on the mm. uh, crow's nest I forgot about mm-hmm. that that was a good time because that always messes people up it's like we're gonna have a fight okay one-on-one what it's like no one likes those one-on-one fights and it's like yep we're gonna do a fight one-on-one on the crow's nest and you're like <laughs> that's and the other people are cheating and so mm-hmm. I was gonna say and with the cheating changes yeah. it. <laughs> right. So that that messes people up. So I enjoyed that. And that was early too. That was the very beginning of the book. Mm-hmm. So that immediately kind of put people off. Uh basically anything that puts people off, uh, I kind of enjoy. That was good. I do like when you get the map and assemble it. I do like uh, you know, when you put it together and then you actually see the map and then you're like, ooh, and then you have to see where you're going. Um, I'm just scrolling through the adventure. Uh, I do like the hut when you see um, and you have to fight the puddle of eyes. Uh, yeah, I think that was one of my favorite things to run as a GM was the was the eyeball room where all the with the eyes and the puddles and that was that was a that was a lot of fun just grossing everybody out well it's gross and then you have the the npcs just like oh it's like oh, what are you doing here here help me help me come in come yep. in you know just like just like they shouldn't even know who you are she's like get in here help me fight these eyeballs and let's go and yep. she's just doing it and i was like okay and yeah. and then that's... having one of one of the pcs lose their eye <laughs> oh really Ooh. yeah he got it back. he got it back he got it back the big show at the amphitheater that's i love waves that's my big thing i do those for my so waves is like i love waves Mm -hmm. waves really test pcs and it forces them to like really fight intelligently and use their resources correctly so i like that one a lot uh that's one of my fun ones and then that brought a lot of uh gears of war memories for me the horde mode yeah yeah I'm looking at the other ones. I do like the rooms with all the little, uh, with all the shale spitters, um, like all the young shale spitters, and they're just all oh, hanging yeah. out in there. And then I, when you fought the earth zuggle, that was funny. <laughs> yeah, guys, so almost sad. Got, you guys got, I know. I was like, why are you fighting it? It's so cute. I didn't want to fight it. You don't have to fight it. <laughs> I was wondering. I was like, you're not even supposed to fight it. It's like they're yeah. just hanging out. I there. think I tried not to fight it, and someone else attacked. And that bad was that people. was Rizzerk. I was gonna bad say, it's, people. it happened. Some of us are bad people. Bad, bad <laughs> people. You're just evil. Yeah. I do like um, Zaktaktar. Zaktaktar, yeah, he's the he's the one who was thrown into the to the well, the undead Gamayan yeah. who just has still been there like for two hundred years, <laughs> like, yep. decomposing. And then you see the art. That's when it starts going like, what's going on here? This is supposed to be fun. Parasite uh-huh. husk. Oh. Yeah, we're fighting this parasite husk that's like undead and actually being controlled by the worms inside of him that's actually the uh the control mechanism it's kind of disgusting so that that one's down one's, i like that one and rough is fun the hearth uh, hearth hound and yeah and then of course my favorite part is event 13 escape from shivering mountain because you can't have 
an adventure without the whole place collapsing on top of you. Mm-hmm. And that's from every movie. <laughs> and that's that's actually on purpose. There's a lot of reasons for that, but it's to first to put you on the clock. Second, it realizes like you can't just dilly dally and you're like, oh crap, and you can't just come back here and just loot the place. It's like it's kind of gone. It's like yep. hope you got what you wanted because you ain't coming back. It's now buried under rubble. Oh, and at the end where you get a ship, and that's the that's the part. I really want people to be feel like a real reward because they're like, wow, we got the star. And that's from the Goonies. That's literally the Goonies. I'm like, oh, you got a ship. I, yep. I literally used the Goonies sure. picture for that. And I was like, yep. so you see, everything comes from movies. <laughs> <laughs> and now you have your own ship. You're like, damn, man, we got a ship. Got to use it. Got to go on uh, go on an adventure. But, but the problem is you got a ship, but there's only four of you. And you need more than four people to run a ship. So Yep. It's yeah, absolutely do. Twos. It's like, oh, we got a ship. I'm like, good. Good luck. You're like, oh, we need a crew. Okay. <laughs> yeah, at least 10 more people. <laughs> yeah, you'll get some. You'll get people. <laughs> That's fine. That's the easy part. That's the easy part. But we actually do that on purpose because on the ship, we made it very abstracted because I didn't want to get too crazy. You'll see. There's a lot of fun things to do. But we just put the fun stuff in. Like, mm-hmm. you, you don't really have to worry about the day-to-day as much. You don't have to worry about, like, sailing too much, but you can do as much as you want. Uh, we put all the fun things in, like telling stories and fishing and, you know, stuff like that. That's, like, the cool stuff. Mm-hmm. And then if you really want to get into it, you can. There's more than enough supplements out there for ships. Like, you yeah. can just use one of those. I didn't even bother sure. with that. So. Yeah, I mean, do you guys really want to start tracking rations? And yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I, if you want to, Rachel, we can. I do not yeah. want to. I'm already <laughs> tracking all the monster parts. That's enough. Yeah, yeah. monster parts. Yeah, I love. Trust me, I think I love monster parts. When we run into my games, it is a little much. There's no way around it. I mean, I do have like, but I, you know, it's it's one of those. But the reward I think is worth it because the gear is so cool and the gear is so much more powerful and useful than standard gear and you get to like design it and name it like a character that and once you get into it so the way we do it is kind of the way you guys do it is like it's designed so you can't carry it that's why they're so heavy it's designed you just use it like you should be taking it and slapping it onto your weapons immediately and if you don't have enough to level up fine just keep using them just use them every night when we go to bed i would have my pcs go through and i just go through and it's like who wants to put what on what like, this is this monster, who's using it? This is this, who's using it. We just go through it and just say, just tell us what you're doing. And then we keep track of it. And um, that way it's it's quick. And because, it, you know, if you don't level up your, your weapon, it's fine. It keeps, it's like experience. It just keeps its monster value and just keeps going up. So it's a bit of a pain, but uh, I think it's well worth it. No, it's very cool. I like I just don't Sp- want to track rations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the monster parts isn't so bad. They're- no, monster parts is fun. I like the puzzle of figuring out what should go where. I do it for all the characters, so I oh, get okay. to, yeah. I, get I would to recommend. What they get. <laughs> I don't know what you guys have, but I would recommend you. The very first thing you should get is a perception item. Yes, n- yes, we have number one. one. <laughs> yes, because I think the earliest perception in. That's that was on purpose. The earliest perception item is like, like level eight or something or level four. It's like very late. It's hard to get a perception item in Pathfinder. But in this, I think you can get it as early as level two. You can get a perception item. And mm-hmm. you're like, oh my god, I get a plus one to perception at level two? Sign me Take up. Take it. <laughs> yeah, it's like that's fantastic. It's like the best skill in the game. It helps in everything. So I mean, especially initiative. as a rogue. Like, yeah. 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 I might be stealing those from one. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he wants me to have them. Yeah, and they're easy to make, so that, mm-hmm. was, uh, that was on purpose. So that, that's everyone. what I always recommend. Do the perception. But, yeah, so, I'm, yeah, I'm very curious to see what you think. I'm going to be way more curious after part two <laughs> to see what happens, or even halfway through part two. I want to see what happens halfway when you get to it, because then it's good. Because part two is what I, I heavily wrote part two probably even more than part three and part three um, was designed heavily by Linda Zayas Palmer and Mark as well as myself. So that's sort of all three of us wrote um, in parts. 
So I can tell you what my favorite parts are, but it's heavy spoilers. But you'll you'll know when movies each of these is from. You'll definitely know. You'll be like, oh, my God, he just took us from this movie. I'm like, yep, pretty much. <laughs> it's like I literally took that movie and added it to the game. So Nice. We should mention Johnny uh, wanted to make sure you knew that he loved Master Olo and the flying pig monk stance. Oh. So I think that was his favorite. Was that whole really pseudo fight? Yeah. Well, Master Olo might be coming back. You might see him a few more times. <laughs> yeah, that was. He he absolutely loved that part. Uh, the little Master Olo bit. None. Lethal but like non dual yeah. duel on the yeah. beach. That's literally like the first thing you do is yeah. encounter him. It's uh, very it's very yeah. karate kid. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Master Olo. And you're like, hey Master Olo. He's uh he's funny. Uh he he shows up again. Was he um I know you are you're a martial arts person. Did, yes. Did, was he an inspirate did you get your inspiration from any of your your trainers? Uh yeah, Master uh, was this, yeah no no Master Kim uh I was um I was Master Kim when I was t- in karate when I was taking Tung Sudo in Pittsburgh and he was the, it was the Tung Sudo Federation and it was at the headquarters of the World Tung Sudo Federation and he was an eighth degree black belt which is Grandmaster and he was really funny because what he secretly was he loved me and my friend mike because we were from new york and we were in pittsburgh and he's like oh and then we had dreams of us like taking this and then opening up a branch in new york because that's that's what he really wanted i I, but of course we didn't do that but he was always talking to us and like helping us and like uh and then when we and then every so often the grandmaster like his grandmaster would show up and he he was like a ninth degree black belt and it was it was interesting i do remember because i took it and the police chief for I went to Carnegie Mellon, and the police chief for CMU also took it. Strangely, uh, this guy uh, Sergeant Ritchie, and he was like six foot four. Okay, a huge guy. I mean, absolutely huge guy. And this guy was a second degree black belt. And then the Grand Master was a ninth degree black belt. Showed up, and this guy must have been maybe five foot four or five foot three, right? Like a full foot shorter, and easily two hundred pounds lighter. And they were sparring, and he just absolutely destroyed Sergeant Richie. He just <laughs> wrecked him. And I was like, and he was like, oh, my God. It was like, it wasn't even close. And it was like Yoda fighting. Uh, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it was like, it was like that. It was like, yeah. you're like, whoa. <laughs> it's like, you know, size does matter, but not when you're at those levels. So mm-hmm. that was the thing I was thinking of when that, with those fights is that, um, it's like, Oh, it's this guy is, uh, the or pork aren't that big. You know, they're actually pretty short. Um, mm-hmm. but then you can be this huge guy and I'm like, yeah, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get destroyed. <laughs> nice. yeah, that, that was, that was basically uh Johnny's <laughs> character. He played a, he plays a knoll who is like seven foot tall. And yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you don't fight Olo because if you fought Olo, yeah. Olo is like level nine or ten. I mean, it would be it would be a very quick fight. It would be a, yeah. one. How do you think it would be one round? I think it'd be like one action, and you'd be down. So right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, any other questions about the adventure, Rachel? Uh, or I should say, the first book, the first book, not the adventure. Yeah, I mean, I guess we talked about favorite encounters did you have a favorite monster because honestly having monsters that i don't know was amazing as a person who's you know been um, playing so long let me see in this Our party's part, favorite was the owl bear but uh, the parrot bear parrot i was bear. like there is owl, no bear i'm like right, owl bear yes. what, the what owl bear turned into running? a parent bear <laughs> so, oh did you fight i didn't listen to all of them did you fight uh, Dungar Hope Eater in this Delagmite corridor. No, they skipped that. Oh. They skipped that corridor. Damn it. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, they <laughs> skipped that corridor. All right, well, that was my favorite. <laughs> mm, we missed it. It's a rune backed Auroch, and it's in a Stalagmite corridor, and all the Stalagmites eight of them are covered with runes 
and they explode with necromatic energy. So throughout the fight, God, I love fights. Like this is what I like. This is something else use the environment. I like to use the environments a lot. In this fight, you are in there and you're like, oh, there's all these stalagmites. It's like, yeah. <laughs> He's going right through them, and he literally just he just plows through them. And every time he plows through one, they explode and they do damage to you. They don't do damage Ooh. to him, but they do damage to you. So suddenly, you're like, oh my god, what is going on? Like the fight suddenly changes very quickly because you realize that okay, we got to stay away from the stalagmites and this guy who's large and charging us and can kill us because he's level four and i'm level three and uh that that's a good fight so you missed it all right well in that case <laughs> uh, uh what's my next favorite <laughs> i like um but uh but sorry and Batarsi? yeah Batarsi and goose bark yeah because goose bark is it's just a funny picture of him riding a beetle because he's tiny because the Gatsagori are only really like a foot, you know, they're very tiny, so they can ride beetles, you know. So that's his that's his mount is a is a tiny fay re- riding a small beetle, <laughs> and and in theory, someone pointed out it's like, well, he doesn't have the right stuff, and I'm like, yeah, I know, it's it's not supposed to like, I don't know if he could really do it, but I don't care, he did it, and yeah, he could figure it out, that he was could a figure fun it out fight. later, yeah, he could figure it that's out. That's good. But it is funny. I could just see the whole picture of you fighting this little. He's literally like, you know, this guy like this big. He's like, ding, 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 ding. he's like skirting around. You're like, oh my god! I'm like I'm fighting this little gnat, and he's totally messing with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just silly. Mm-hmm. So those are some of my favorites, but the best ones are yet to come. Let me tell you. Oh boy, mm. you're gonna have nightmares. I guarantee it. Okay, what was the creepiest, the most disgusting thing you saw in the first book? What creeped you out the most? How about that? Um, I'm trying to think. I know the first creepy thing was uh, the person who was pretending to be a goat person that turned into some creepy undead, right? At the entrance of the cave? What oh, yeah, that? yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, the um, screaming poet and um, yep, and uh, mm-hmm. Yashimbi. Yeah, pro- I mean, you know, we already talked about the Gamayan with the worm infestation. You've been dead forever. That's probably the grossest, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, you'll 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 uh, you'll see more of that. I like. <laughs> I, I still like the the room full of eyes. The the eye puddles. Oh, That's the eye puddles. Yeah. Eye puddles was good. It's yeah, always so, fun when there's hazard and monster. Yeah, yeah. So that was again. This is again on purpose to to sort of to make things very like out of out of sync. You know, like you're like, oh, I'm fighting. You know, it's like you think you're fighting the same things every time. Like actually, I'm doing. Um, the circus adventure and you're fighting uh, Zolgaths in that adventure every single time. And it's like, Oh my God. Like it was fun the first time, but by like the third book, it's like, Oh, now it's the headless Zolgath. Now it's the forearm Zolgath. Now it's like, ugh, enough with the Zolgaths. We get it. Like they're all the same and it gets very samey after a while. Uh, and that's something we tried to do is just, you're never fighting the same type of creature more than really well, more than once, but you are fighting more than once, but not in this in a row. Like, like you can be fighting very different things very quickly. So you're always on your toes. So. Well, and that makes mm-hmm. the throwbacks fun too. Like we fought the dolls and then we fought them as training dummies. And because it mm-hmm. wasn't so common, it was a fun, nice nostalgia thing. Um, or you fought the, the weak, slowed chamber ooze and then you fought the full on chamber ooze. Right. You get to learn and figure yeah. out the best tactics. Yeah, that was our, those both those creatures are too high for you. And so we had to weaken both of them. <laughs> and the the thought was is that they've been fighting each other for so long that uh, they're just worn out. 
in theory, mm-hmm. I mean, the room doesn't show it. Like the description of the room probably should be like you go in and this place is just absolutely destroyed because they've been fighting for like 200 years or something. It's like literally two creatures that cannot hurt each other. And, and, and they're in a room of healing. So they're infinitely getting healed and fighting ever. <laughs> <laughs> so it was crazy. And they just they just they have a moment of stalemate where they go back to their corners like boxers. <laughs> just just get never ends. <laughs> yeah, it just never ends. They just fight forever. And okay, the one is a construct, so in theory he could fight forever. In theory, the chamber ooze probably left and got something to eat and then came back, you know. It's like <laughs> in theory they, they probably left, but but the construct never leaves. They they can stay alive forever. Uh that was that was Patrick Rennie. He came up with that. I did not come up with that. I did make it a healing room. We have a we have a couple questions here. Okay. Not related to the adventure before before we before we wrap up. Sure. So you you, you can feel free to answer these or you could or or not. Okay. Depending on depending on the question. How I feel. Yeah. <laughs> So the the think the the first one we kind of what we kind of went over already was with regards to the RPG RPG Superstar contest, mm-hmm. and the question was, do you do you now that you've self published Battlezoo and all the Battlezoo products, are you are you going are you getting a lot more? freelance submissions and pitches outside of the RPG superstar contest. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> not really. No, not really. I, you would think so, but one of the things is at, at roll for combat, we're covering things that, okay. One of the advantages is that Mark and I know what Paisa will and won't do. Like they would not do a dragon book. Like they would like to, but they wouldn't. It's too risky. So we did, 130 page book on one ancestry literally and people love it like it's very 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 popular but they probably wouldn't because it's to them it's a little too risky a little too niche so we're able to do that uh monster part system way too complex way too hard for them the monster part system secretly is nothing more than a reflavoring of the runic system that's actually all it is uh you can actually take out the monster parts and just add runes and it still works because it's using the exact same math. So, you know, that's something I thought up when I first hired Mark. I told him about it because I've been, I've been wanting to do that from like Monster Hunter and for a long mm-hmm. time. And I thought it'd be very fun. And and he likes it. And so we do that. And then, you know, people actually let me rephrase that people do come up with ideas. And when they do, ninety nine point nine are shot down. Actually, let me rephrase that. A hundred percent have been shot down, and I'll say why because they're usually too niche. Because like someone's like, "Oh, you should, and one of my like Lauren Sag who loves Vikings, she's like, you got to do a Viking book. You got to do a Viking book.'" And I'm like, "No, <laughs> it's way too niche. I will not do a Viking book. You know, we just can't. It's too it's too small an audience. So I'm just not going to do it. You know, we could do maybe a Viking archetype, but that's about it. But like this world of Indigo, even this book." This lore book, this is an experiment. Hopefully it does well for the Kickstarter because we are doing things in this book that we actually did. Okay, let me back up. We actually did a survey. So we do a lot of surveys. And so Mm -hmm. we did a survey and we asked people, what do they want to see in the book? And the top four were like, we want lore. We want story hooks. We want NPCs. And then they wanted towns. And I'm like, done, 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 done. There you go. You got it. Those are the four big ones. That's that's what you're getting. Like we, you know, and it was funny because I never really am that excited. I mean, where does our magic items in it too? But, I, you know, I read it. I'm like, eh, magic items. That's okay. Oh, and say Ancestry. Sorry, that was in the top five too. Uh, ancestries. A lot of people want new Ancestry. So we're like, got it. New Ancestries, new things to play, new things to do new things to add to the world, stuff like that. But then I'm like, what about magic spells? Like, I don't care about that. That was on the lowest thing. That was like one of the lowest ones. So I'm like, good. I didn't really want to add those anyhow. (laughs) So we're very careful with that. And then Year of Monsters. Oh, my God. That was a huge hit. So that's, uh, 
you know, one new ancestry a month based off monsters. And I will give you an exclusive. If you've managed to listen for one hour and 30 minutes, I will tell you what next year's is going to be called. If you oh. want. Do you want? Or, or do you, you don't want to, Jason, do you? Let's do it. Sure. Let's do it. You sure? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> see how many people really listen to this. So okay. we are doing it for 2024. I think people knew that. And we sent out surveys uh, mm-hmm. of some of the of the new ancestries. We gave about like 20 to 30. And we've been talking about it on the Discord. It's not yeah. a secret. Uh, and in fact, we were going to have like Centaur, but, but Paizo's doing it. So we don't need to do that. And Awakened Animal was in the top three. And we were going to do Awakened Animal. But <laughs> Paizo's doing it, so actually it makes our lives easier. I'm like, good. I have others we can do. We have a lot. We had a whole bunch of in yeah. here. This one will be called the Year of Legends. Love and it. It's going to be legendary monsters that you can now play. Oh, <laughs> sweet! And there's going to be a couple in there. That you shouldn't be able to play legally, but you will as a PC. (laughs) (laughs) If anyone knows what I'm talking about, there's certain IP that uh, Wizards of the Coast owns, but we figured out a way to make it that you can play those. (laughs) Interesting. (laughs) No one will touch with a five foot or ten foot pole. Let me tell you, no one will touch that. But Mark and I figured it out. Oh, wow. (laughs) After going through the OGL fiasco, I'm very well versed in the law of how OGL works and what can and can't be done. So there's, I know, very popular certain ancestries and races that have existed in the world of D&D for 40 years that people have loved to play. I mean, it's, you know, even Paizo said they're not doing drow because it's too closely related. We're not doing yeah. drow, by the way, that's already done. Uh, but yeah. we're doing ones that no one, and I mean no one, not even Watsi has done. And when you see it, you guys are going to lose your minds. So Interesting. Mark's writing those. <laughs> <laughs> so Interesting. So that that one will be coming out and that'll be the same same thing that we did for this year uh 12 new ancestries one a month uh this time we'll probably list them all out uh, ahead of time uh so you'll know what's coming which month and we're also we're going to do a kickstarter for that one that one will probably be in october uh, okay because and just a right as basically october to november it ends and boom you get the first one january you know it goes right into the beginning of the year it goes right into the beginning so and then you know every month for the rest of the year you'll get a new ancestry and continuing what we've been doing and you know you'll have it in the foundry vtt and now we've done it for pretty much a year and of course it's in path builder of mm-hmm. course so you can you know use it very quickly yeah um and now we have it down to a science. We're going to be cranking through these. So yeah, my uh, my players, um, Rachel can can comment. They absolutely love it when because I can just I just upload the JSON file and and um, as soon as the Foundry update comes, it loads up into our world and they can they can toy around with it and it's yeah it's they love it. Yeah, the sl- strangely, the slime is seems to be the most popular. Everyone loves the slime. Yeah, we've yeah, got the slime. someone in our private game doing slime, right, Jason? Isn't yeah, we have a we yeah. have a slime oracle of time. Yeah, as, as slime time, and then slime time. That's great. And then we have a Steno rogue. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I love Steno. Steno is a weird one, but I, I like it a lot. The most, I mean, Mimic is really popular. They're all pretty popular. I mean, number one's Dragon. Like, Dragon, oh, my God, everyone's playing yep. Dragon. Like, that one's yep. very, yeah, very popular. Uh, it's very good, though. It's it's And there's so much to do for Dragons. And then Slime seems to be pretty popular. Even in my games, a lot of people people are playing Slime. Like, Slime just seems to, it's just popular. I'm, I'm kind of mm-hmm. surprised. Uh, Doppelganger. Doppelganger is the most interesting, I'd say. Because the mechanics work without breaking the game, and you actually are a doppelganger, like a real doppelganger, which is cool. I really like the she. I think that like that's the that's the one yeah. I really want to play if I get the a chance. She are awesome, and the yeah. she is very cool, and no one knows what it is, but once you know, it's basically like ancient fairy folk 
like mm-hmm. the, like the the sort of nasty fairy folk. You're like, oh, I know who they are. Like you know who they are, but you don't know their name. Uh, even Mark pitched it. I'm like, she. I'm like, what the heck is a she? And he's like, trust me, they're cool. And then I read it. I'm like, oh, these guys are really cool because they are very mischievous. They're like like leprechauns, basically. They're you know they're yeah. like oh all the people all those evil fae. You know that you see you they're, read in fairy tales. That's them. And they they're the del, they're the Del Toro Fey. They're, that's yes, the, that's... yes, that's exactly <laughs> what they are. They are Del Toro Fey. They're very creepy. They can they, be. They can get very creepy. And they can pull the strands of fate. It's so cool. Yeah, they're really cool. Uh, and demons. By the time you listen to this, demons, will be out. That also mm-hmm. is one of the most popular ones. Demons is interesting from a role playing point of view because demons. You actually are a demon, but you're redeemed. You're literally a redeemed demon. And then, so how do you play? You know, it's like a good demon or a bad you're Hellboy. Angel. You're Hellboy. Yeah. Yeah, actually, you are. You are Hellboy. So, you know, that's kind of, again, that's where a lot of this gets into because you get to play something that's, you know, either popular in culture or you get to play. You know, how can you play a demon? Because everyone's like, how can you play? Because demons are usually pretty bad and evil and stuff. And I'm like, well, we have reasons here. They're all, you know, like they're redeemed. And it goes into why you're redeemed. And that goes into your uh, heritage of like, what type are you? Of what type of redeemed demon and what you're trying to do now that you have a second chance. So, so cool. Yeah. Yeah. So. The next question was about challenges, but I think you talked about some of the biggest headaches you've had <laughs> with this AP. So that and just yeah, and also, so it's five hundred and twenty thousand words is the counts for the adventure path. Uh, it's really is that right? Is it five hundred twenty or two hundred and fifty? Oh wait, it might be five hundred twenty for the whole thing. I might have been saying that number wrong. Well, it's a lot. <laughs> it's it's a lot of words. It's way too big. And everyone, I know people have been complaining and they're wondering where the book is. Look, you only get to do it once, okay? I could have had this come out earlier, but then it wouldn't have been as good. It wouldn't have been as amazing. You know, it's just like, look, I like it's only going to come out once and this will be it. So, you know, hold your horses. The PDF is out. The boundary module's out. You got everything you need except for the hardcover book. Uh, but that is coming any day now. Uh, you know those are coming out, and then it'll be done. They never have to bother me ever again. Uh, maps, maps were the biggest problem. Yeah, yeah, but they're absolutely gorgeous, though. Yeah, they took forever. They, the maps took over. They took like a year and a half to do the maps. So yeah. uh, that's what I learned that uh, maps take a long time. <laughs> yeah. So the um, one of the things I've been I've been hearing too, is just that the the book is so big that it just, it feels like it should be a six book AP just because of all the content that's in it. Yes. And I, I, I keep telling people that it's, there's a lot of words there, but it's not like there's more adventure. Whoops. That, yeah. There's, there's no more adventure. It's, yeah. it's just more words. Yeah. Cause there's a lot of, and I keep, I keep trying to explain to people there's a there's a lot of words and a lot of toolkit for GMs on um, which I think is great. Like it gives you the options on here's how you handle this situation if your PCs do this, and here's how you how, how you can handle this situation if they do this. And so yeah, it's it's actually that's on purpose. So the number one thing I always find out after is what they cut. So. Uh, and uh, a standard adventure, it's either 32,000 or 36,000 words. I forget uh, for a Paizo adventure. We'll say, I think it's 32,000. So you say 32,000 words and they have to cut stuff. I mean, they just do, you know, it's like they just have to. And our adventures are, I think, like 60,000, 65,000 words each. So I think the last one's like 70 or 80,000. So uh they're big (laughs) they're big adventures and uh but they don't take any longer they're the exact length of a paizo adventure the exact number of fights there's nothing extra it's just that we go into depth and detail in the world which is usually the very very first thing cut from any other adventure because you have to and uh you have to save space 
and they try to get it through through other books or through the you know through discord and chat rooms they used to do that in the old days in the chat they used to even sometimes publish stuff that was cut james jacobs used to do that he'd be like okay this stuff was cut but here you go and he would literally like kingmaker had all this stuff cut and he actually posted it on the uh, paizo message boards for people to use so we just kept it all in there. There's everything you need. And then some is in the adventure. So you have more than enough. And I think it also tells, I think it's better for the adventurers because it tells a better story. And the worst thing that ever happens is when you're running an adventure. And this actually happened a lot. This actually happens all the time that I'd be reading the adventure and then you would say to do something, and then like a page later, it would contradict it. And I was like, oh, you can't do that. Like, that happens all the time. So we're very careful. I actually did. You, so the way Paizo usually does it is they have them like read what happens, and then they tell like the backstory secondary. Uh, and that's just because the way you want to read it. And just if you're skimming it, it's better to do it that way. But it's bad because sometimes the backstory relates to the first part. So you got to be careful. So I did the reverse where you have the backstory first and then you have what's going on and it makes it a little harder to skim, but this way at least you get the background and you know what you're talking about when you mention what's going on in this room. So little things like that, you got to be careful of. So that was changed. Actually that happened a lot because they were all Paizo writers. So they always wrote it the other way. And I was like, Nope, write it the other way, write it. Write the backstory and then say what happens, not the other way around. That way also that they don't contradict themselves because sometimes they forget what they wrote just a few minutes ago. And then they're like, this doesn't like those don't match up. Now you've messed up the adventure and people will notice that. And I see that in Paizo <laughs> Adventures and it drives me crazy. Especially when I'm the GM and I just read something and they're like, wait, that doesn't make sense. I'm like, I know that doesn't make sense. Ignore what I just told you. <laughs> and then you're taken out of the adventure and everyone starts talking and joking and you're like, no, no, you don't want that. So the, uh, the next question I have is, um, so being one of the, one of the most, uh, spotlighted figures, I should say f- during this whole, uh, Watsi OGL fiasco. Now that everything's been settled, what do you think was probably the biggest lesson that Paizo and other third party third party publishers what they can learn in terms of communication with their customers and their player base? Oh wow, that's not where I thought it was going. Yeah, so for the OGL fiasco, if no one knows. Mark and I actually broke it a day before Linda <laughs> and we were, I was the one who released OGL 1.02, I forgot which one it was. Uh, 1. Yeah. 2. Uh, I'm the one who released it. Mark and I are the ones who did the original leak or 1. whatever it was. Uh, oh, 1.1. Yeah. 1.1. We released that. Um, we were basically everywhere. We were working with Paizo and Orc and we announced the Orc license. So like every major pa- aspect in January, we were in front of, what I learned, which actually I already knew because I work. So my day job is working with corporate America and I basically build fortune 500 websites. And I learned this lesson a long time ago is that most companies, not all, but most companies are not your friends. And I used to say this on my podcast about like EA and Blizzard and all these companies. And they're like, what do these companies make? And people will say video games. And the answer is no, they make money. The video games are a byproduct, and that's how they make their money. But they make money, and they just happen to also make video games. And that's the secret, is that they make money. The the how the way they make it through role-playing games is secondary. And people learn that the hard way very quickly, that there was no community to them. They couldn't care less about the community. They really don't care about their players. And to you to them, you are nothing more than a way to spend money and to get money from your wallet. And that is it. And, you know, I don't think all companies are like that. Pies is definitely not like that. And we definitely try to not be like that. Like we always listen to the community. Like we are built on listening to the community and building what you want using our tools and knowledge and set of skills. 
you know, we purposely are coming out with things that I think people would like and use in their games as opposed to, you know, just coming out with stuff, you know, it's like, you know, that's, that's sort of the difference. That's the number one thing. It's that they were, they were not your friends. They never were your friends. They used to be, I think that's the problem is that the way they positioned the way their, their messaging was that they felt like they were your friends and they felt like they were part of the community. And they were at one point when they were part of TSR and they were going to Gen Con every year and they had the castle and they would sit down and I'd meet with everyone and I'd meet all the people, but they haven't been to Gen Con in years. They, okay, like every, so both Patrick Rennie and and Ron Lundin, who did Jolie and Nicole Isle, both work for Watsy. I have never heard from them since because they can't talk to anyone now. Like as soon as you get that job, you're gone. You have NDAs and you can't talk to anyone about anything. And they're totally they can't do podcasts. They can't do anything. So they're just gone. And, you know, they're cut off from the world as opposed to, you know, the Paizo people who now do a lot more outreach and they show up on shows and do interviews or like me and Mark. I mean, Mark, geez, Mark's everywhere. I mean, you, you talk to Mark. Everyone can talk to yeah. Mark. You know, you can talk to me. It's like, you know, we try to be part of the community and really like in the do that. So that that's what you got to remember is just actions speak louder than words. You know, just because it seemed like they were part of the community and they seemed like, because when that first broke, so we broke it first and that day, uh, and I and we posted it on like Ian World, and like I'd say about sixty percent of the people didn't believe it. They and they went they went hard on us. They're like, "You guys, how dare you?" Someone called us a terrorist. Like, how dare you? Like, try to break up this world. And it's actually someone from Ian World. It's like a mod on Ian World called me a terrorist. I'm like, dude, oh, so. yeah, because there they thought were like, "How dare you? How dare you besmirch Watsy's good name?" Yeah. And I was like, dude, dude, like. <laughs> you wait <laughs> i was like i stand by this i had three sources yeah. and then owen casey stevens even came to our defense he's like i know both of these guys there is no reason for them to put this out they get nothing out of it so if they say it's true it's true and then the very next day yeah. linda Codega's article came out which was exactly what we said because it was the same it was the same source but it came from the same you know uh, document and everyone went, uh oh. And then they went from, wow, we can't trust these people. And and it actually was interesting. The closest analogy I can think of was a re- it was a religious war, because role playing games, I think, are very much part of people's definition of themselves, and people. You know, even more so than video games, because you put so much into a role playing game and into characters and you've been playing with your friends and it's such a big part of your life. And then there was a chance that this company decided that not only was it theirs and not yours anymore, but we're going to take it away from everyone and we are going to control it. And everyone just lost their minds and literally said, OK, you have just basically declared war on me. And that's why the reaction was so violent and so strong so fast because people realized it, it would be like saying, oh, like I'm a big baseball fan. It would be like, you know, if someone's like, oh, uh, yeah, baseball's going away uh, just because, just because. And I, I would lose my mind. You know, I'd be like, what are you talking about? Uh, this is like my definition of my life. Like this is like the main aspect of my life is watching and following baseball. So if that went away, I would – I don't know what I would do. <laughs> I'd be in. I'd be in bad shape. So, yeah, yeah, that's crazy. I remember, I remember the old, uh, the old Gen Con days when they were in Milwaukee. I never oh. even went to Gen Con in Milwaukee. I only went to Indianapolis. So, yeah, but yeah, I mean, they were a big part of the community, and they were a big part of like you know, you'd be able to talk to them and. And you read them and see their names in Dungeon Man Dragon Magazine, and you'd see your stories about them. Like they were just very, you know, larger than life and approachable. Yeah, that's disappeared. That's a long time ago. Yeah, it was. I guess the last question we have is Pathfinder Remastered. Yes. So the 
the so your new products with with world of indigo isles and year of legends so that'll be that'll be for the remastered it's for everything i mean i mean i knew about the remaster we did the first interview with eric mona i knew about the remaster uh, a couple months before it was announced Uh, i do know still things that haven't been announced uh with the remaster The, the biggest one it doesn't really affect us because the number one thing that changes for us is alignment. So alignment's yeah. gone, but you can still put it in. So like, for example, we are taking alignment out for NPCs. That's yeah. gone. Uh, and that actually is because the, 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 uh, the book is written as narrative. It's sort of like uh, we did like a Rick Steves guide to Indigo Isles. If you know, Rick Steves is, he does these narrative books where he literally goes to places and then writes tour books based on his experiences. So they're first person. Yeah, he's very popular. Fantastic tour books. So we did the Rick Steves approach, where it's literally you're getting a tour of the Indigo Isles by Glimmer, the um, uh, Harlequin Dragon. I was like giving you a tour. So it's from their point of view. So they don't know their alignment, you know. So how would they know? So you know they they would say, okay, there's this NPC, and this is what they do, you know. So that's one thing. Ninety five percent of the changes have to do with individual classes and yeah. we have nothing to do with those. Okay. So it won't affect us at all. And other things is they are changing terminology, but it's not like I can do about that. Like, you know, yeah, but we do try like, so Van- for example, in our five E product for your monsters, we use species instead of race because they said they were going to use species and so we just, everything's a species, everything. We don't use the term race because that's what they said they would use. So we were trying to be ahead of it. Now they yeah. said they might not be using species. They're going to probably use something else, they said. The problem is that there's not a lot of good terms out there. There's only like <laughs> right. two or three. There's like species, ancestry, race. That's about it. And all three have been used. So. <laughs> and you got the, and you, were, you, lo- you waited too long, man. You could have had ancestry, but you waited. You could have had species, right. but you waited. That's already used by Starfinder. I'm like, you guys waited too long. You're running out of names, and now they're, they're rethinking it. So, but yeah. otherwise, remaster is almost all mechanics and classes. So okay. it does, does not affect us. Yeah, I just I didn't know as far as the uh, the balance goes if that no. was um, because I think they're just really focusing on edicts and anathema from now on. So yeah, if that's we already have that in our God book. Yeah. Um, we already have Edith and Anathema for all of our gods, so that's already yeah. in there. So we don't have to worry about that. We do have the we do have the alignments. I still like having alignments in there just so you get, you know, you don't have to be that alignment to worship that god. And we have pantheons, so you can worship multiple, and they can be mm-hmm. different types. So that's fine. And just like real life, like you know, you can be evil and worship the god of good if you really wanted to. Um, they might not give you much, but <laughs> True. and they, they might not give you anything, but you can still worship them. So, <laughs> all right, I think um, I think two hours should be about should should be about it. Did you have any other questions, Rachel? I don't know. I appreciate uh, you taking the time, though. It's been really cool. Yeah, I I had a blast. Do you have anything else, Steve? That you wanted to? No, not really. On that, you know, again, hopefully everyone enjoys the adventure. It is out for 5e too. Um, I mean, I mostly talk to the Pathfinder people, but the 5e version is also really good. That was converted by David N. Ross, who does all the conversions for Paizo. So it's the same guy. So he did all the conversions and then it actually went through Paul. And I have two other, so I have three 5e slash Pathfinder people. So we made sure everything works for both. And he knows both systems. And actually, the adventure is different. There's actually different encounters, like that wave. Instead of four waves, there's three waves. Like, it actually changes the adventure because 5e has very different balance. And there's actually 10 more pages in the 5e adventure. So that was also fun. Uh, fun as in not fun. Total nightmare. <laughs> to come out with the adventure twice. So it's like, okay, come out with the hardest adventure imaginable. And do it for two systems. Good <laughs> luck. And, and I was like, and it's 400, and one's 420 pages, and the other one's 400. And 
30 pages. I'm like, oh my God. That's and literally you had to do the layout for both. And I did the layout for everything. And it was really hard to lay out. And I usually like layout, but it took months. And I had to edit it and I had to write it. I mean, that's the thing. If you look at the credits, <laughs> it's not a lot. The artists are a lot of credits, but like three writers and then me and Mark edited it. And then Aleph uh, helped heavy with play testing and editing. And that's it. <laughs> that was, that was it. It was just really, just really me and, and Mark going through and fine tuning it. And that's kind of it. So, so I am done with my uh, Moby Dick. This is it. Uh, <laughs> we might do a small. We might do. I say I'll never do it again. I never will. Because by the way, when they came out with uh, Rise of the Rune Lords, the single book, they said they will never, ever do that again. They were going on how the nightmare was. And then they did it with Curse of the Crimson Throne. And then they did it with Kingmaker. So, of course, I heard Kingmaker almost killed them. So, uh yeah, that took that was also by mostly one person that that hard. It took them like three years to do that thing, and then they so, did it for Abomination Vaults. And now they're doing Abomination Vaults was designed for that though. The That's Abomination true. Vaults is basically the same adventure, just uh, and they did it for um, Ruby Phoenix. That's so, true, they did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, those are designed uh, for that. Like the they didn't have to really do anything new. Yeah, they they got smarter. Um, but if we did do this, it would probably be smaller adventures um I, I don't know if we will because also the adventure the good news is this adventure is done and hopefully we made it so good that a lot of people will run it and also it can stay evergreen that this is something you can run now or in five or ten or twenty years like just run it forever um i tell i tell people that that they're looking for a starter adventure to just just run book one of indigo isles it's a great yeah. star, it's a great starter adventure yeah, and it was designed that each one could be run individually. Like book one, just you know, if you want, it could just end there, and you're like, oh, you you got the gem and you got a ship, huzzah! And then every and then just make it a big party at the end, and that's it. It's over. And just then give the gem, just give give the yeah. the gem to the king, and yeah, or you, you can even make that the jewel. Like if you wanted to, you could just say, oh, that's the jewel in the god, and you won, ta da! And then the game ends, and you could just stop it if you wanted there. And you could you could start it with book two, very easily because that's like oh we've got it we're going on an adventure we found this one gem now we got to find the other three parts and you're like oh okay got to go on that adventure and then for book three well that one's a little weird <laughs> yeah yeah that one that one would be a little harder that one would be a little bit harder that one would be a little bit harder but it could be done it definitely wouldn't work as well because you wouldn't have the connections with uh, the world but it could be done um, but yeah that book. It's very. It's also very easy, and it starts off easy. And people who are not used to Pathfinder, uh, because that's the very first thing. So what we're talking a lot with five E people that are moving on to Pathfinder now, and we've been working with a lot of them. And their first thing is like, so let me ask you something, Steve. Uh, I ran a severe encounter, and then I ran another one, and everyone died. Why? And I was like, <laughs> and I was like. <laughs> Because you ran two severe encounters yeah. one after another. It's like, yeah. yeah, but in 5e, we do that all the time. I'm like, yeah, it's not 5e. You're going to die, man. And he's yeah. like, huh. I'm like, yeah, this thing is pretty hard. Like, you will die. It's pretty deadly, man. It, like, it's if you don't know what you're doing, you will die, especially after two severe encounters one after another. And they were very shocked. They were like, wow, uh, that doesn't happen in 5e. I was like, yeah, well, yeah. there you go. It's not 5e. <laughs> so um, you're going to die if you do that and they were they were really stunned they couldn't believe people died they were like what is going on how did they all there was there's died they tpk that was a total party kill i was like oh my god they're like what happened and they didn't let them rest that was the other thing they did too severe they didn't let them rest between them oh my goodness and i was like Yikes. dude and they like mark and i were like the system's designed you're supposed to rest between encounters yeah. and if you don't you will die which is yeah. why i like waves because waves if done correctly you can get them like oh the next wave is coming 
and we did that in ours. It's like you got two rounds, and then the next wave comes. And I was like, hurry up, hurry up, rest, rest, rest. You know, it's like heal, 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 heal. I was like yep. healing because you know you're supposed to be fully healed. So like you use those two rounds to heal up and get ready and cast spells and then go. And then the second wave comes and you fight that one. And then it's like, okay, oh, you got two more rounds, and you see the third wave all over then they're coming, they're rushing towards you. And then quickly you start healing up and you're getting ready, and then you fight, and it's like, and then you get through it all and you're like, ah. Oh. And you're exhausted and you used up all your resources for that day, but it was I, fun. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's like, do you have any potions? I have potions. Can you get right. over here? I'll pull it out of my bag. Right, right. And you, every <laughs> action out. counts yeah. and like you're passing it to one person or throwing it and everyone's like, oh, I just let me get here, get it. Because you have very little time because you know you have to be healed up. Because if you didn't get healed up, you would probably all die mm -hmm. <laughs> by the second or third wave. So I love it. Now I'm excited. I really want to hear what happens in the part part two uh, i'm going to be yeah. listening to every episode <laughs> well thanks for thanks for coming on steve mm -hmm. we'll have you back on for uh, probably at the end of book two since so in since a Ron, year since in Ron a year will be able to, <laughs> yeah. to join us unless he leaves watsy he can't join us yeah, i know you wanted to you're talking about getting patrick and i was like good luck <laughs> you'll, yeah it's like you'll never a you'll never find him and because he doesn't really write back and b he works for watsy so and i know ron's a even if ron did leave he's super busy so yeah he's pretty busy he actually might be able to do it i don't know i could ask him uh he would be interesting because his adventure he wrote really he's he's a machine like he he cranked that thing out so fast and so did patrick actually it was linda's was incredibly complex, so hers took a very long time to. I know you create. and I talked about some of the challenges you made. I'm not yeah. going to say anything because I know Rachel's it's very, here. But... Yeah. Very complex that adventure, so. but worth it. All right, thanks, Steve. Sure, appreciate it. Thanks.